Hey everyone, the name is Eric Dorn. In today's video, learn how 10 years of Jungian psychology can completely transform your life, helping you go from a point of an absolute low or depression or autopilot into a state of flow and assertiveness and healthy personal growth. Yeah, Jungian psychology is probably one of the best methods you can assume in order to fast track your personal growth, making you more energized, more motivated, more confident and more secure in yourself. In this video, learn about my personal five steps of awakening and how I woke up to myself and how I became more individuated and how I even started to understand the limits and the possibilities of self-transcendence. But before we get started with this video, don't forget to leave a like and to subscribe. First of all, I want to show you why you want to engage in personal growth. What's the point? Why should you study your personality? Why should you take an interest in yourself at all? I mean, should we not be less self-involved? Should we not be more concerned with other people? Shouldn't we focus ourselves on the world around us? Yeah, there are absolutely two routes you can take. First, you can choose to hold on to and cling to and pursue the persona, your mask, your status and your value and worth to the world. You can find yourself pushing yourself to fit in and make yourself a part of the world or you can choose to take a little bit more of a dangerous path into the self, understanding who you are and finding your personal truth and your personal journey. You have two choices to take. You can either live for yourself or you can live for other people. And now I want to show you why, first of all, making the choice for yourself is not necessarily a selfish choice. First of all, I want to say there is nothing wrong with taking an interest in yourself. In fact, I would argue that you are quite a fascinating individual. Isn't it marvelous? Isn't it fantastic? Isn't it amazing that you are having unique thoughts and experiences? That you have ideas that other people don't have? That you have had feelings and experiences that other people don't have or understand? Isn't it fascinating that there is a part of you, a world inside of you, that is different than the world outside? Shouldn't we be interested in that world? Shouldn't we seek to understand that in ourselves? What is so wrong with the study of the self? What I've found is that people that can practice a healthy amount of self-involvement can also become increasingly compassionate as a result. By taking care of yourself, you become a healthy, fulfilled and happy individual and you set a positive example for the world. By being a happy and healthy individual, you spread and make positive decisions that are for the better of everyone. And so the practice of self-nurture is also the practice of nurture and care for other people. What I would argue is we live in a world today fixated on the persona and on the other. We all try to fit and mold ourselves to the world and so we all find ourselves not feeling like we fit in. Everyone feels like an outsider, everyone feels alien in a world that they have completely molded themselves to. We lose ourselves and so we lose our happiness. The first stage of personal growth is really the state of pre-awakening. And in the beginning of your studies of Jungian psychology, you're going to find yourself fascinated with all these labels and definitions and tool sets. The study of labels of your personality type or of whether you are introverted or extroverted will become the core of your focus. And you're going to find yourself fascinated with these concepts. These labels are going to feel like an ultimate truth and an easy and stereotypical explanation that seems to fit with and connect with everything. Everyone seems to fit into these neat little boxes. However, the longer you study people and the longer you study yourself, you'll start to notice that your system doesn't have all the answers. There seems to be a problem with these definitions. There seems to be a problem with these labels. Understanding this leads to the second stage of um, Jungian awakening, and that is the search for truth. After a time of questioning, you're going to find yourself uh, wondering if there is a true or better way to organize these definitions. Are there, uh, is there an ultimate objective truth, an ob objective system, a 100% scientific method that will completely explain personality type and the intricacies and complexities of the human mind? 
What I found myself doing was studying body language. I was fascinated with whether our micro expressions could potentially lead to and explain everything about a person. Could I be giving away my personality type right now with my sheer hand gestures? That was what I was thinking and what I was hoping. I was hoping that in this I can find a definitive truth that will explain who I am so I, so I will have no doubt anymore about who I am or what my purpose is. And that's of course the goal. But after years of trying, I <laughs> realized that I was no closer to an answer than when I had begun. Despite sometimes feeling like I got it, the next day I'd wake up realizing that I didn't have it. And no matter what way I thought of to organize all these concepts and definitions, I'd find contradictions. I'd find that the human mind did not want to be explained. I would find that all the intricacies of a human or a human being cannot be defined simply through eight letters or through eight cognitive functions. Disappointed after years of trying, I decided to instead start looking at neuroscience and genetics, hoping that maybe there I can find a key, maybe there I can learn about how things really are. Perhaps in studying modern neuroscience I can understand how the brain really works and how we really make decisions and how we really process information. I started by reading through various reports and journals in neuroscience and trying to reformulate the Jungian cognitive functions by connecting them to known networks in the human brain and mapping thought processes out to findings in modern neuroscience. But instead of finding objective truth, what I ended up finding was meaning. Why am I studying personality? What I found was that the more I learned about personality type, the more I learned about the brain, the more I learned it was malleable. We could change, we could act in any way we chose, we could learn to engage in any kinds of behaviors. Our brains were not predictable or could not be forced into boxes. Instead what I found was that everyone had unique ways of responding to different forms of activities and one person might take joy or energy or confidence in a certain range of activities while another person might find confidence and motivation in other sets of activities. What I'm finding in this is that we are different not in how we think, because anyone can think in any particular way, but in how we, what emotional associations we have to our thought patterns. And so what I ended up doing was studying how personality type was connected to flow. And it was only at this point where the study of personality psychology became actually meaningful for me. Instead of trying to cling or fit myself to a box or a category, I started trying to understand what could make me a happier and healthier person and human being. The idea of flow and psychic energy, as Carl Jung would call it, was and did come to define my focus for the last five years. I have been fascinated with trying to understand what health is and what happiness is for each of the 16 personality types. Now, people often think that when they find their meaning, when they find their purpose, they will find happiness. But that's often not the case. I had discovered what I needed to do in order to achieve a state of flow, but I found that I didn't want to. There were parts of me, parts of my mind that were self-destructive. There were blocked doors and pathways. Whenever I tried to enter into or engage in positive or healthy habits, I found that I was in a war with myself. A war against my learned and ingrained patterns, a war against my persona and identity, with my attachments to status or to YouTube likes or to popularity, with my desire to please other people. I found that while I knew what I needed to do in order to feel flow and happiness, I couldn't engage in that state because I was so preoccupied with the needs of other people. I had started engaging in people pleasing behavior and it had started getting a power over me. I had lent the outer world a degree of power over me in which I felt I had no personal control. What I discovered was that I was in a battle with my own ego. And this is where a lot of people give up. Most people don't really succeed in personal growth because how are you supposed to possibly beat your own ego? How can you ever conquer your own bias? I mean, your mind, your ego is yourself. How could you possibly win in a match against yourself? How can you, with your thoughts and your lessons and with your experiences, potentially uh, conquer yourself 
a person who knows everything you know, a person who thinks everything you think, a person who feels everything you feel. This battle of ego versus ego has been manifested many times in fiction and in the games and in movies in a battle against the self, similar to how Luke had to step into that cave uh, in Star Wars and battle against himself. Uh, you have to engage in that same battle against yourself, a battle against your ego. And how can you win in such a battle? What I've found is, thankfully, beyond and besides the ego, you also have the superego. And the superego represents everything that you are capable of becoming, every potential version of yourself. There is a part of you that could become anything. There is a part of you that is completely malleable. Everything that you have could transform and change into something else. You can become anything or become anybody. And so you have within you the capacity to change and the capacity to become more than what you are. One plus one can somehow equal three in terms of human psychology. And that means there is a possibility if you are prepared to listen to your unconscious and to let yourself be inspired by your unconscious, there is the capacity for transformation. And Carl Jung, he argued for the existence of a transcendent function, a function that bridges the known self and the ego with the unconscious. The transcendent function helps you dialogue with the unconscious and oh, there are many ways of doing this but one is to pay attention to synchronicities in your life patterns signals symbols to study your own dreams to pay attention to patterns that you fall into to practice awareness and to practice an understanding and an acknowledgement of your own gut of your own uh, hidden whims and urges of understanding uh, the side of you that is in a transformative stage. Understand that there is a self that is formed and that is fully crystallized and there is a higher self. There is a self that is in the process of transformation. While the unconscious, uh, or rather, while the conscious is full of labels and categories and definitions, the conscious, the ego, tries to make sense of everything, tries to explain everything, tries to rationalize everything. The unconscious, on the other hand, is constantly trying to topple everything, is constantly trying to transform everything, is constantly trying to change everything. This is the component of the self that is in chaos. And so often Carl Jung warned of uh, surrendering yourself completely to the unconscious and rather what he argued for is a process of integration of the unconscious in the conscious sphere. And so what you want to try to do is you want to try to make sense of and rationalize and understand the unconscious and come to understand that there is an order in chaos, just as there is a chaos in order. Think of the yin-yang symbol. There is a black dot in the white, there is a white dot in the black. And so you can find that in all your labels and definitions and in your tight control and in everything that you have explained up to this point there is something you don't quite understand there is something that you don't quite get there is something weird there is something that contradicts itself and contradicts everything you know and if you start following that thread of thought down and you start asking yourself questions you're going to get answers i had my own kind of dark night of the soul and I had to spend the last five years really knitting through and unpacking myself and working through and recognizing all those different uh, parts of myself. I had to make peace with and let go of a lot of things. And um, one thing I had to let go of was my concern with my status or my success. At some point I had to come to realize that it didn't matter to me. It wasn't that important. It didn't matter as much as I thought it did. I didn't make or break me as a person. My work came to be highly meaningful for my personal growth and my personal path to self-transformation. And I experienced my first form of true genuine awakening last year in the autumn. And that I felt the sense of true knowing, of true understanding, of true seeing of myself. I experienced a seeing that went beyond myself. I felt complete. I felt one with all and with everyone. And I felt as if I could see and experience myself. And I could feel a sense of 
a self-acceptance emanate in this a sense of control and confidence of knowing i felt amazing and uh, the problem was i also felt terrified because i thought you know what if i fly too close to the sun what if i uh, go too deep what if uh, yeah i go crazy and all of this what if uh, I go too far in the pursuit of personal growth. And so I kind of ran from it. And uh, what I ended up doing was I pushed myself back down. I thought, I'm not ready yet, you know, because also <laughs> feeling, in, feeling in control of everything, feeling a sense of um, fuller awareness and attention I also became aware of how uncomfortable I was feeling. You know, like one thing I recognized was that, you know, I was in flow, uh, but my body, my physical self was not up to par. My health was not up to par. My personal situation, uh, my lifestyle, my how I lived, everything was off, you know, like um, it's kind of like, you know, turning the volume on and realizing that the song that is playing is a terrible song and being like no I'll turn down the volume and what I had to realize you know was I had to change the song so it took me a few months of processing and working through that fear and uh, getting myself back in line but what ended up happening what ended up causing me my biggest shift was my um, surrendering to the sensory and to the material um, I had always been a genuine intuitive living in the world of my own imagination and I'd always avoided the outer physical world my intuitive projects my ideas took up most of my time and I thought I had no time to uh, work on my physical self or my comfort or uh, on my health or well-being the only thing that mattered was my intuitive process and the project of realizing my ideas but Nowadays, I engage in up to two to three hours of physical exercise every day. And that's not a necessarily intense exercise, but that is I'm out all the time. I'm reading all the time. I take a book with me. I take a mug of coffee with me. I sit outside by the water. I walk in nature. I enjoy being immersed with things. You know, today I was seeing two uh, birds, you know, like singing and uh, kind of just flapping their wings at each other. And I was just in a state of marvel, just observing that and being a part of that and, you know, experiencing that. And that's, you know, when I realized, you know, like uh, in a state of flow, you kind of find yourself and lose yourself at the same time. And that's the contradiction of it. The more you find yourself in flow, the less these categories seem to make sense. And that means at some point, your whole self becomes kind of fussy. It's like when you're a dancer, you know, like when you're in that stage, you know, like there is a place, a time and space where everything, time and everything ceases to exist and have meaning, where there is only the here and now, and there is only everything that you're doing in that uh, moment. And uh, the same goes in a sense for flow, because in a state of flow, what ends up happening is uh, you become an intuitive sensor, a feeling thinking type. And you know, Carl Jung, he said that, you know, when, uh, when feeling and thinking are balanced, there is wisdom. There is only wisdom, you know, that uh, the balanced integration of feeling and thinking with one another is what drives genuine wisdom, a genuine sense of knowledge and fullness. And it's when uh, these categories exist, as long as these categories exist, there is tension, there is conflict. And so the contradiction that exists is that um, often the more intuitive you become, the more sensory you become, the more feeling you become, the more thinking you become. You know, like in embracing yourself and who you are, there is uh, an ability to transcend the self and to become more than what you ever knew you could potentially be. And so what I'm seeing is a lot of people come out of and try to engage in personal growth in the wrong way. 
There are so many introverts out there that talk about wanting to become extroverts and intuitives that talk about wanting to become sensors and feelers that want to develop and practice their thinking. But what I'm finding is that in that process of forcing yourself to become something you are not, you are creating an unconscious resistance in yourself and the shadow of your own introversion uh, comes to bite you and <laughs> comes to bring you back to yourself. There is sure progress as you feel like you're able to put yourself out into the world, but there is also collapse in the sense that the more you put yourself out into the, the world, the more overwhelmed you become, the more tired and drained you become, and eventually you lose the will to go on and you go back and withdraw to your shell. But in being able to accept that you're an introvert and in the, being able to step into and accept yourself for who you are, there is an ability to energize yourself and recharge your batteries. And in that, there is the energy to go out into the world. And there is a shadow, your extroverted shadow comes up and allows you to pull, pulls you in and invites you into the outer world. And so by being fully yourself, you become also your own opposite. And in that process, I think you kind of do lose your personality type. And so you find your own genius. So where are you at in your personal growth process? What are you wrestling with right now? What can I help you with? Leave your thoughts in the comments down below and I hope to see you all in the next video.